Welcome again. And if you're just now tuning in, I want to welcome those online. One of those things that I forgot this morning, I was rushing a little bit during the welcome time, and I forgot to mention this very, very important thing. You know, many of you know Marilyn Boucher, and uh, she is on our staff, works in an administration area. Well, recently, her and Ross just completed a kind of a life dream of theirs, and they are going to be snowbirds for a few months out of the year, and they're going to be up in the Virginia area, and um, and she, one of the things she's going to be doing, she's going to still work on the staff. She's going to be working remotely, and so she's actually online as a hostess right now, kind of hosting the online. If anybody has any questions or if you guys are uh, checking out the church, if you have any questions about the church, you're able to, to just type online and she'll be right there and she'll help answer those uh, questions for you. And so we're happy to have Marilyn. When she comes back, she'll be back in the office. She's going to do all the things that she can do uh, remotely. In fact, I've said that she might get more stuff done now <laughs> that she won't have as many interruptions. We'll see how that how that works out. But we're so happy for her and Ross and what they're going to be doing as well. You know, today we're talking about worship, and I know in a, in a room this size, we come from all different types of backgrounds. We have people from as far as the Catholic Church, which is, makes up a large portion of our church, all the way to those of you who grew up, you know, strongly Pentecostal, charismatic, and we have everything, you know, in between on that. Now, for me, on the first 20 years of my life, I grew up sort of in the same church, same format, same style of worship, same type of worship, same thing that, you know, I didn't, I didn't travel much. We didn't go anywhere besides Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, then Florida on vacation. That was pretty much my travel experience for the first 20 years of my life. We didn't travel a lot around the country. I didn't have any international trips or any experiences outside of just sort of my denomination that I was a part of, and that was kind of all that I saw. And so this was sort of an example of what I grew up with. Some of you may be able to relate to this, and some of you may not be able. If, if you didn't grow up in the church, you might not be able to relate to some of this, but I sort of was in a, in a bubble. bubble. In our church, there was no clapping. I mean, you would not clap in our church. I mean, clap, you know, it, it, I mean, even for the greatest celebrations, you wouldn't clap. If somebody was baptized, you know, in our church, the angels in heaven, it says, were celebrating, but we didn't clap. And, and in fact, after a baptism in our church, we did this, like, it was almost like this funeral dirge song. We said, you know, now I belong to Jesus. Does anybody know that? Jesus belongs to me. Not for the something, 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 but for eternity. And then everybody sat there. Yeah. There was no... No, no clapping. <laughs> there was no clapping. I mean, you know, and I always just thought, man, that's strange. Here the angels are celebrating, the Bible says, but we're not allowed to celebrate. You know, it's like this person just died. Well, they did die, so to speak, when you're baptized. It's like you're dying to Christ, but there's a resurrection. Let's cheer about the resurrection, you know. So, yeah. No hand raising in our church. There was no hand raising. If you raised your hand in our church, there's a good chance the pastor would say, you know, you need to go to the bathroom? Go ahead, you know. Like there was just no, they might dismiss you for the service. We had a piano and organ uh, in our church and everybody wore suits and ties. And we had this big, huge, uh, ornate communion table right up in the front. Some of you know that. And it had this dude in remembrance of me. And the elders came down the aisle with the communion trays and they marched in perfect cadence, you know, Dum, dum, dum. And they came down, and then, and then, and, and the men were the only ones that were allowed to serve communion. Women weren't allowed to serve, even though I found that just completely strange because there's nothing in the Bible about that. And yet, at the same time, as soon as church was over and we went home, they expected all the women to serve. That didn't make any sense to me. And then, and then the men would all take, they would come up here and they would take their communion first before they serve the church people. And I thought, that's strange too, because that's like inviting yourself, to, inviting someone to come to your house for dinner and then eating yourself first and while your guests are watching. I always just thought that was kind of strange. But that was kind of the church that I grew up in. Um, you know, and, and there was a lot more do's and don'ts. I don't know that I ever really heard a lot about the Holy Spirit. 
in our church. And it was just kind of, that was just kind of the church that I grew up in. I love the people. It was fantastic. It was awesome. We had a great church, but that was just sort of my bubble. And I thought everything had to fit in worship into that, you know, paradigm. And that's what worship was. It wasn't until Michelle and I first got married, and I had traveled a lot to other churches, but all the churches that I traveled to looked like the church that I grew up in. So I had seen a lot of churches later on, but, but it was after Michelle and I had been married for a couple of years, it was before kids, and we were on vacation in Myrtle Beach. And, we, and I said, hey, let's go, on, let's go to church while we're on vacation. And when this is before Google, you couldn't look and see if, you know, what the services were like or anything. So I said, let's go to someplace different. Let's don't go to the kind of church that we always grew up in. Let's go to someplace different. And so we saw this big church up on the billboard. And we thought, let's go there. Let's go to that church. So we get there. And, and the ushers sit us. We get there a good bit early. And the ushers sit us right where you guys are. Third row, front and center. I mean, just third row, front and center. And it was just not where we wanted to sit. You know, being a first-time guest, I wanted to sit towards the back. If things got crazy, I could just head on out. So all of our first-time guests, we try to leave those spots for you guys in the back, you know, like that. And so, but they sat us right there, third row, front row, center. And about 10 minutes, five minutes before the service, one of the leaders came up and he goes, Hey, folks, I just want to let you know that today we have a very serious church business, very traumatic situation that we need to deal with. And uh, if you're a guest today, we wanted to give you enough time to go to another church if you wanted to, you know. And so um, you can stay if you want, but, you know, it just gives you a chance to go. And Michelle said, what do you want to do? I said, are you kidding me? We're staying right here. I want to see what's going on, (laughs) you know. And so the service started, and sure enough, when they came out, you know, and they delivered the news, it was bad news. Their pastor had committed a moral failure or something, and, you know, I've heard that over the years far too many times and seen that and the destruction of that in churches, and that was sad. But what happened afterwards was a new experience for me that I'd never experienced before because the, uh, the keyboard player, he comes out, and he's like, Wah! and starts playing on the keyboard and then another guy comes out and says well the devil's not going to get the best of us today we're going to worship through this which is true and it was great but all of a sudden everybody stood up and the music's just going crazy and the drums are going crazy people started bringing banners out and they're marching down the aisles with these banners and people were jumping and hopping and everything and, and then they formed a line dance I'm not kidding you like a line dance now I, I, I mean I exaggerate a lot I get that but I'm not exaggerating one ounce in my shell they form a line dance and they're going through the auditorium, you know, like doing this. <laughs> Pretty soon, the whole church, this thing would be, can you imagine if all of us got up and started doing a line dance around the building right now? That's what it was like around the inside part. That's what it was like. I thought about doing that this morning, but I thought it might be a little weird, you know. <laughs> and so they all piled in. Pretty soon, it was just me and Michelle by ourselves sitting right there in the front row. And Michelle goes, what do you want to do? I go, grab your purse and get in line. So... <laughs> She grabs her purse, and we're like going through the auditorium, you know. Da, 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 da. We got to the back door, and we peeled off. <laughs> we went out the back door. Man, that was one of my first experiences of really a worship service that was completely outside of my comfort zone and completely different from everything or anything that I had grown up seeing. Now, fast forward 30 two years later, you know, and over many years, I've either spoken for or led worship for or just attended uh, just about every church that you can imagine. I've even spoken uh, in a Catholic church, which I'm not even sure is legal. And, and I mean, like, I, I've, I've preached in every kind of church that you can imagine or led worship, both in the United States, around the United States, and internationally. I've, I've been a part of 13 different countries and cultures, uh, and 14 if you count Canada, and so, you know, I mean, just like all of these different areas, that was supposed to be funny for our Canadian people, but <laughs> you guys didn't, didn't catch on that. But all these different cultures and all these different places, I mean, I've seen like dancing in the aisles or, or people dancing on the stages. I've seen a blowing, one church was blowing a shofar. You know what a shofar is? It's this long, you know, long ram's horn thing. And they, they blow this shofar. And when they blow the shofar, all oh, the people of the church just shout to the Lord. I mean, it's just shouting to the Lord. Just as loud as you can shout, they would shout to the Lord. 
I've been in church environments like that. In Jamaica, in the mountaintops of Jamaica, they do these claps during worship. And I still, I'm like Steve Martin in the movie The Jerk where I just don't get it, you know. And I, I've got rhythm and they've got these things that they do. And the clapping is just unbelievable. And if you ever get a chance to worship in Jamaica, it's just, there's just nothing like it. It's just fantastic. I've been in churches with robes and, and choirs you know, singing old hymns written by dead white Europeans from 200 years ago. And I've been in churches with fog machines and lights and drums and songs written by 25-year-old skinny jeans pastors, you know. I mean, you know what skinny jeans pastors are? I'm not a skinny jeans pastor. Although my jeans are a bit tight, different reason. I've I've been to services where I've prayed for people and they've just fallen down, fallen out of the spirit. If you, some of you have gone to those. I've been in churches where they speak in tongues. I've been in churches where the worship was completely in Spanish, French, Patois, Swahili. And I've had to have people translating what I'm saying and we're just worshiping in different languages. It's been amazing. And if you ever go, get a chance to go with me to Latin America or to Kenya or to Africa, and I hope that you do, and I hope that we get back to some of that now that things are kind of in the world getting back to a little bit of normalcy, except for in New York and California. Um, uh, But I'm telling you, if you get to go with me to one of those places, if you're one of these people that sit and worship like this, you're not going to be able to do that there. I'm telling you, they will grab, you're going to be so filled with joy just watching them. You're, it'll take the grumpiest old man and he'll un- uncross his arms and he'll be dancing in the aisles and tapping his toes. It's absolutely amazing. And if you don't like it loud, don't come or bring your earplugs because I'm telling you, if you think our music's loud, this is like easy on Sunday morning listening compared to what you'll hear there. It's, it's just kind of, blistering loud i planted a church in the dominican republic and we were having a uh, we started a church there and we were having an outdoor service for the launch of the church and i'm sitting outdoors michelle's back home in florida i'm in the dominican republic i'm telling you guys i like it loud i'm a musician i like it loud it was blistering my ears blistering my ears it's so loud and i even texted michelle Uh, I texted her on the phone. I said, go outside on the back patio. (laughs) Lean your ear to the southeastern sky. You might just be able to hear us. I mean, that's how loud it was. It was absolutely amazing. I've been in churches where I've led worship in flip-flops and shorts, and I've been in churches where I've preached in a robe. Um, One of my favorite churches, I'll give a shout-out online to Salty Church in Ormond Beach. Anybody know about Salty Church in Ormond Beach? Ormond Beach? Florida, North Florida. (laughs) Yeah, Salty Church in Ormond Beach. If you ever get a chance, go over there. It's so fantastic. I'm telling you what, it's right by the beach, and you can go inside, and there'll be surfboards lined up along the, because people will come right after surfing or going to go surfing. There'll be beach toys and lawn chairs and beach chairs sitting up there. People will come in their bathing suits with cover-ups on, and it is so fantastic. People are coming, and people are coming to the Lord in crazy ways, and it's just a fantastic church. And then I've been in churches where there's a lot of relics, and there's a lot of stained glass windows and golden goblets. I've been in worship services with a concrete building and a thatch roof and 90-degree temperatures and no AC. One of my favorite worship experiences is in the mountain of Costa Rica. And I mean, it's just a concrete block building and it had the cockeyed, you know, fluorescent lighting that flickered was terrible for your eyes. And one really very out of tune worship leader from a, with an out of tune guitar singing worship in Spanish. And the guy standing next to me is telling me what I'm singing. And I will tell you, I've never experienced the fullness of worship like I did that moment. And it was like heaven opened up and kissed the earth. And I began to bawl like a baby because I was just crying because we met God there. Now, why do I tell you all that? I tell you that because all of that, all of that in all its forms and all of its styles, all of that is worship. And yet, none of it is worship. All of it is worship, and yet none of it is worship if the heart is not right. All of it is worship and none of it is worship unless our heart is absolutely right. I've had people come from a church that lead worship 
Um, and they've even come here. They come from a church that leads, you know, old style with pianos and organs. And they'll start coming here and they'll say, you know, hey, I, I just couldn't worship God any longer there. I had to get where there's drums and guitars and more modern music. And I, and I don't usually say it, but in my mind, I'm thinking this. I'm, I'm thinking, really? You couldn't worship God because of an organ or a piano? Really? Same thing. Oh, I can't worship there. They got these clanging cymbals. And, you know, really? You can't worship God because of clanging cymbals? You probably wouldn't have liked it very well in the early church and the tabernacles because they played cymbals a lot in the early church. Now, I get it. I get it. We all have our different preferences in worship. I have my preferences. You have your preferences. But that's not what worship is. That's not what our worship is. You may go to a different church because the preference of worship, but don't ever say, I can't worship God because I don't like the music. I don't wor- can't worship God because I don't like that style or whatever. And here's the thing. I'm not at all trying to convince us this morning that one type or one style is right over another. Not at all. In fact, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of what I want you to see today, that it's not about any of those things. I had a in another church, I uh, had a worship leader, one of our worship leaders came up to me, and she thought she wasn't getting enough time uh, on the stage, and we rotated them, you know. She thought she wasn't getting enough time. She thought she should be uh, worshiping, leading more. And so I said, uh, I said, why do you think this? And she goes, well, the truth is, you see, she goes, I can't worship unless I have a microphone in my hand. I said, What? Can you repeat that? I just need to process that. She said, I can't worship unless I have a microphone in my hand. I said, hmm. Let me think about this for a second. What do you think you would do? I said, what do you think you would do if the God of the universe revealed himself to you in his full glory right now? What do you think you would do? What do you think that you would do if the God who spoke and a billion stars were created in the galaxy and he revealed himself to you in all of his might and all of his power right here? What do you think you would do? What do you think you would do if you met the God who hovered over the waters of creation face to face? What do you think you would do if God in all of his glory, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that caused the walls of Jericho to come tumbling down, what do you think you would do if you met him in all of his majesty and power and glory, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, what do you think you would do? I'll tell you what you would do. You would fall to the ground like a crumpled piece of paper and you would tremble and you would hide your face from the brightness of God. God's righteousness, that's what you would do. And I tell you what you would not do, you would never raise your eyes to the Lord God and say, I'm sorry, I can't worship you because I don't have a microphone in my hand. Yeah, so I'm over it now, I'm completely over it. It's completely fine, you know. I did tell her that I wanted her to take six months off. And to go on a journey and figure out how to worship God without a microphone. What is then true worship? What is authentic worship? I think one of the best descriptions that I can find for us about what true worship is comes from the Apostle Paul. When he's writing this letter to the Romans, to the Christians in Rome, he's writing this letter. These were the Gentiles. Now, what was a Gentile? If you're kind of new to the Bible, a Gentile was anybody who wasn't born of Jewish birth and didn't grow up in the Jewish faith. And these were people outside of the kingdom of Israel and God's chosen people. So the Gentiles would be, if, you, if you're outside of the, if you didn't grow up in the Jewish faith and born Jewish descent, then you would be considered a Gentile. So probably the vast majority of us in here would be uh, the Gentiles. And so Paul was writing this message to those of us who didn't grow up in that Jewish uh, faith and culture. And he starts out in Romans chapter 12 with this, when he says, therefore, therefore. Now, if you were with us, I don't know, three or four, five months ago or so, I did another message for another therefore, another passage of scripture somewhere. Uh, He starts out by therefore, therefore, 
Anytime you see a therefore, it's important. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, this is not biological. If you're, you know, this is about, you know, you're part of the family of God. You're part of our church. We're family. You know, you're part of the family. You're my brother. You're my sister. And we're you know, kind of like adopted brothers and sisters here. He goes, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of or in light of God's mercy for what he has done for us on the cross through Jesus Christ, offer your bodies. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is, this, this is your true and proper worship. Now, I want to talk. I want to talk just a minute or two about the therefore, okay? The therefore. And, that, uh, and so this is one of those situations, and we mentioned this a few months ago, that chapters and verses were an add-on. This, this was, Paul didn't sit down and write verse 1, verse 2, chapter 2. He didn't do that. This is one continual thought process of what he was writing. That didn't come for about a thousand years afterwards when we realized how difficult it is for teaching purposes to be able to find where we're talking about in these contexts or in these letters. And so a guy named Stephen Langton, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, he separated these verses and, and chapters out. Well, this is one of those where I kind of think, well, this is kind of an odd place for a therefore to be. And so there's several of these odd places where they kind of separate a scripture out. And so it becomes a challenge for us if you're a Bible student or a Bible, you know, you like to study the Bible, which I hope that you do. You know, when you come across a scripture like this, it's so important to go backwards and look at what came before the therefore. Because what came before the therefore is important. You know, that's what sets the whole thing up. And so, um, in fact, a good way to remember that is, wherefore is that therefore, therefore. (laughs) So when you're studying, let's, in fact, that's kind of fun to say, actually. If you can say it together with me, like, if you can do it with my kind of enthusiasm, that'd be great. You ready? You ready? Here we go. Wherefore is that therefore, therefore. And so anytime you hear a therefore, we need to go back. We need to look and see what came before that that must be so important that he's saying therefore. Now, in this case, what most Bible scholars think is that Romans chapter 1 through 11 is everything that Paul is setting up about the Christian life, about the Christian for, the, for, the, for anybody outside of that Jewish faith. And he's setting this up, that this is what God has done for us. This is who God is. And then chapter 12 through 16 is about the application. Therefore, because of all these things, therefore, you need to live this way. You need to submit this way. You need to change your life in this way. And so I would encourage you to read chapter uh, 1 through 11 this week. Well, actually, read the whole book of Romans. You can do that. I'm, I know you can do it uh, in a week time, no problem at all. And so what, uh, what I want to do is I want to sort of give you, we could preach on the book of Romans and we could be in this for four months and still only scratch the surface. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through Romans chapter 1 through 11 and just do a review for you. In, in, and I should have it, you out of here by two or three today. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to do a quick review. I'm going to leave a lot of really, really good stuff on the cutting floor here, okay? But this is just the best attempt that I know to, to give you a review of Romans chapter 1 through 11. And then when we get to 12, he's saying, based upon all that I've written to you so far in this letter, he says this, every one of you is bound under sin. Every one of us is bound under sin. He says, and, and that, that justification of our sins comes only through the propitiation of what Jesus Christ did. Now, if you're new, you go, propitiation, that's a big word. That sounds like a church word. Sounds like Christianese to me, you know. And so what is propitiation? Well, uh, I need to simplify things for me, you know. And so when you look at propitiation, the best synonym that I can come up with, the best synonym is the word satisfy, satisfaction. It's been satisfied. So propitiation is very, very similar, almost the same as satisfaction. And here's the thing, because God is a holy God, because he's righteous, because he cannot sin, because he's perfect, he's holy, he's blameless, his anger and his wrath and his justice burns against sin. 
Sounds like a hellfire brimstone message. It is. God's anger and his justice and his wrath burns against sin. And he has sworn that all sin will be punished. That there must be a satisfactory for the debt of our sin. And it comes through the death of his son. So, so uh, when, I went to, when I was in college, my first two years, I, did, I wasn't on a full scholarship. My second two years of school, I was under scholarship. So we had to take a lot of uh, student loans out and stuff um, for my first two years of school. And going to a private college and for ministry and seminaries, it, it can be quite expensive. And so my dad took out a loan in his name for me which is a student loan. And I'm not sure exactly why or how this all happened, but he took the loan out. He just managed all that. And he took the loan out. Well, when I graduated, I began paying that loan back, even though the loan was in my dad's name. I began paying that back religiously, that faithfully. It was just kind of what I, I knew that was my responsibility is what I was supposed to do. Well, about seven years into that, which I think seven years on a student loan, I only paid like $2,000 off the thing or something. It was crazy. You know, I owed like $20,000 on the loan. And Michelle and I, we were married, and I wanted to know what was the payoff amount for this, for this debt. And so I called the loan company, and I said, hey, I'm trying to find out what my payoff is for this loan. And she says, okay, what's your Social Security number? So I told her my Social Security number. She says, well, that number doesn't match. Uh, I can only talk to James Todd, and, uh, and, and I can release that information to him, but I can't release it to you. And I go, well, that's going to be really hard to do because my dad passed away about three years ago. And she goes, oh, well, then that debt's been satisfied. That, that debt's been paid. When your dad set this loan up, he set it up in some way that if something happened and he passed away, that the loan would be paid for. Now, I would have taken out a million-dollar loan to have my dad back, right? But I was sitting there going, man, this is like, this is a free gift. This is like a free gift. And it came at the expense of my dad's death, you know? And then, and then just to finish that story, uh, I sent them the death certificate and about three years worth of all the payments they sent to Michelle and I. And it was like, whoo, we had this like amazing, amazing gift. That would be an example of propitiation. That would be an example of the satisfied debt because my dad passed away. And Paul's talking about that. He's talking a lot in chapters 1 through 11 about this propitiation or the satisfaction of our sin, my sin, your sin, the sins of humanity being paid for by the death of Jesus on the cross. And it's like God is saying, if I punish man for his sin, man will die and go to hell. On the other hand, God says, if I don't punish man for his sin, my justice will never be satisfied. So what's the solution? The solution is, God said that he would then become our, I'm going to use another church word, substitutionary atonement. He becomes the substitute in our place of, for our debt, for our sins, for the sin of mankind upon himself in agony and blood through Jesus. A righteous judgment and a substitute for sin. And here's the thing, that same angry wrath-filled, fire-burning God. His wrath burned out on the cross when Jesus died for our sins. That's propitiation. And Paul says, and this is love. This is love. And that justification or what saves us is by faith, not by works. Not by something that we can do or we're shortchanging what Jesus did. It's by what Jesus already do in us putting our hope and trust and faith in that. He says, he goes on to talk about this and he says, everyone inherits sin through Adam, but in Jesus Christ is made alive and made new. And when we died and when we rose with Christ, we became new. And the law then, the same law, the 613 Jewish laws, the law no longer became our regulating principle. 
And that, satis- that sanctification, gosh, I'm using lots of church words today. I get it. I get it. But I'm going to keep trying to explain them. That sanctification, what is sanctification? That's the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the holiness process. That's the, bec- that's the part of us becoming more and more like God. Not that we'll ever, ever attain that. But it's the process of, of, of sanctification, becoming more holy, more righteous, more like Jesus. And then he says, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing. And then, and then this is where he ties it together. He begins to tie it all together. And he says, and the Gentiles, that's, that's mostly you and I, I would think maybe all of us, the Gentiles have been grafted in to God's plan for his people in Israel. That the Gentiles have been grafted in. What does it mean to be grafted in? Well, it's like we were adopted We were adopted into the kingdom of God. You were adopted. If you put your hope and trust, faith in Jesus Christ, you've been adopted in to his kingdom. And God is sovereign over all that he does. And God has a future plan for every single person on the planet who believes. That's my best attempt at doing an overview of the 11 chapters of Romans. And then Paul says, starting in verse 12, based upon all this that I've said, based upon all this that you've heard me write before this, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this, this, this is your true Improper worship. Worship is more than a song. It's more than a style. It's more than these instruments up here on the stage. It's more than robes or flip-flops. It's more than projectors and screens. It's more than any relics or golden goblets, or it's more than any stained glass windows. It's, it's more than lights. It's more than coffee and donuts. It's more than padded chairs. It's, more than, it's even more than communion. It's more than these walls. It's more than the air conditioning. It's, in fact, if we just stripped all of this away, if somehow we just stripped all this away, and we were just standing right here in a field right now, worship would happen because of the greatness of God and who He is. Worship's not a place we go. Worship's not an event that we attend. Worship's how we live. It, 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 it's the very essence of our being. Worship is what we were created for. And worship comes from the condition, flows out of the condition of our heart. If you're living in purity... You're worshiping, you know. If you're giving sacrificially through generosity, you're worshiping. If you're serving, you're worshiping. If you're devoting yourself to God's word, you're worshiping. If you're praying and you're listening to God and listening for his still quiet voice through the Holy Spirit, you're worshiping. Worshiping is singing with reckless abandon for the joy that we have in our heart because he rescued us. It's actually kind of hard to explain except just say that worship's everything. Worship's everything. It's your life to God. It's your entire soul, your very heart, your mind, and your bodies. These are the words that came right before the therefore. Paul says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? And I love this. He says, for him... And through him, and for him all things. For from him, and through him, and for him are all 
things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. And that is worship. Let's... uh, Hey, let's let's stand together, and uh, I'm going to pray for us. And then after this song, if there's anybody that wants to um, come up for prayer at the end of the service, we'll be over here to your left. And if you want to know more about how you can get plugged in and, and know more about the church, we'll be back in the back of the next steps area. Just love to meet you and shake your hand, talk to you. But right now. Let's just pray. Let's quiet our minds, quiet our hearts. And just imagine, just imagine stripping all this away. Standing before the God of the universe and worshiping him as an outflow of our hearts and thankfulness for what he has done for us on the cross. So Father, we worship you and we praise you. We ask And we confess for the times that we have made worship about us and not about you. Lord, I pray that we'll come in all of our sin and all of our brokenness and we'll pour out a song of praise for what you've done on the cross for us that you've rescued us, that you took the place where it should have been my debt to pay and our debt to pay, and you paid the debt for us, God. And we come not because of relics or not because of ceremony or not even because of this building. We come simply because you are worthy. You are worthy.